Here's a little video on something I've been wanting to mess with for a while. This isn't something that's really new to me, but I have not tried a minimum component count version of this idea. And this is something I remember seeing in a magazine article way, way, way back when. And I'm going to call it the Blinken Lights experiment. The idea is to get a microprocessor and we're not talking about modern ones, but old-fashioned, vintage, 8-bit microprocessors to randomly flash a bunch of LEDs with a minimum parts count and at a very low current, something that could run on battery power for a long time uh, and do it with, again, minimum components. So the components I'm limiting myself to here is this 1802 microprocessor. This is a, you can tell from the finish, it's been sanded and relabeled. It's been pulled out of some other equipment and some uh, mill somewhere probably in China has sanded the original markings off and um, you know silk screened on or whatever, stamped on um, markings to say that it's a Harris part. It could be anything but I have already tested this chip in one of my 1802 computers and verified that it works, at least well enough to not be obvious if it has any issues. Um, I've got nine LEDs. I have a NPN bipolar transistor. This is just a 2N2222. Pretty much any general purpose NPN would work. And then I have two resistors and a capacitor. That should be the minimum required to make the clock for the uh, microprocessor. The idea here is to use this topology. This is a sort of, it's a variation on one of the classic um, RC inverter oscillators, which requires two inverters and at least one resistor and one capacitor. So I'm using an effective inverter that's between pins 1 and pins 39 of the microprocessor. Those are labeled as the clock input and as the crystal output. Normally you could connect up a crystal circuit there or you could just leave the crystal output disconnected and have an external clock just feeding into the clock input on pin 1. And if you just put a resistor and a capacitor around this one inverter, it won't oscillate. You'd need an additional inverter. But I don't want to have to put a whole other IC on here uh, to get just that one inverter. So I'm going to use a resistor and a transistor to make a, you know, a poor man's uh, inverter. So I need a pull-up resistor on the output of the transistor. So that'll be a, a second resistor. I'll have the transistor and uh, we'll see if we can get that working. The first thing I want to do is just power up the 1802 and uh, I can leave pretty much everything just hanging on it except for a handful of signals. Here are the signals I need to do something with. VDD and VCC are the two power supply input pins, pins 40 and pin 16. Uh, one of these has to do with the internal logic and the other one has more to do with powering the, um, the I.O. pins. But for this purpose they're just going to be tied together and connected up to 5 or 6 volts. The 1802 has a weight input which is active when it's low by pulling it up to V plus I'm assuring that the processor will not go into a wait state. There is also an interrupt input, also active low. By pulling it high, I'm assuring that the 1802 won't try to do an interrupt. The 1802 has a built-in DMA function, uh, and there are two dedicated pins for that, the uh, DMA in and the DMA out, but those are both inputs and they're both active low, so pulling those high make sure the 1802 does not try to do a DMA function. And then we have the eight pins of the data bus, which can be either inputs or outputs, 
but uh, we're going to leave those floating except for one, and I'll talk about that later. There's also a clear input, also active low, which normally I would do something like this with. Just have a capacitor to ground, small value, a pull-up resistor, so that on power-up it clears the processor back to its you know, default starting state. Um, to minimize the number of components, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to tie this high so it's not doing a clear. Okay, I have all the things jumpered to V plus that need to be. I've also got the um, VSS or ground pin connected to my power supply ground. I've got it powered from a 6 volt bench supply. I also have my transistor, my two resistors, and my capacitor wired up uh, in the previously mentioned oscillator configuration and I've got my oscilloscope clipped on and I'm getting this waveform here. It's a very slow frequency so it's not the clearest but you can see there that we're on 2 volts per division and that's a 6 volt power supply so we're getting a full 6 volt span on the signal. It's mostly high and it dips low um, and the interval is one, two, three, four and a half divisions at 10 milliseconds per division, which works out to about 22 hertz. So that's in the ballpark. My rough calculations had said it should be maybe a little closer to 10 hertz, but component tolerances and so on. At least the oscillation is happening, so now I can move ahead. Now, a couple of things about the 1802 microprocessor. First off, it's CMOS, the first microprocessor to be mic uh, made out of CMOS fabrication. Uh, we're going to run it in the 10 to 20 um, hertz clock, so it's closer to 20. Uh, the 1802 can go down to a clock of zero and not have any bad issues. Obviously, with a clock of zero, it's not executing any instructions but it also has not crashed so you can dynamically clock the 1802 way down to zero which essentially puts it in a hold state and then the next clock pulse it gets however long it takes before it gets it it will move ahead one step in its machine cycle and it can go incredibly slowly that way so it has no problems being clocked at approximately 20 hertz for this experiment uh, a couple other things is that uh, the 1802 has no dead instruction space. So when it executes uh, instructions from memory or wherever, every opcode possibility has a valid instruction. There are no dead instructions where nothing happens with certain combinations of bits. The only thing we're doing here is we're allowing them to float and by floating they just pick up random electrostatic fields you know they just float around to different values so every time it tries to read data on the data bus it's going to get some random combination of bits however the instruction whose opcode is zero zero in other words all data bits at zero or low that's the halt instruction and uh, you can't recover from that without doing some other manipulation. So I don't want this thing to execute a halt instruction. So for that reason, I have to take one of the uh, data pins and tie it high so it cannot be low. So I'm going to do that now. Okay, so I've got my extra jumper put on here to tie... Um, the D6 input. Again, it could be any one, but I'm using D6 because that's the way the sketch I'm working off of um, is marked. So that's pulled up to V+. Now, some other things about the 1802. So we already established that it can work on very low clock frequencies. Uh, and we're preventing it from executing a halt instruction by tying the one data input high. So 
we're not connecting anything out here. There's no memory connected to the data to the address bus, and there's nothing connected to the data bus except for that one pin I've already talked about. So the 1802 is being clocked, and it's not being cleared, it's not being told to wait, it's not being interrupted, it's not doing a DMA operation. Therefore, it thinks it's connected to memory and it's going to be executing uh, whatever instruction it randomly gets on the data inputs. And based on that, it's going to go to different uh, addresses. So the eight address bus, which is 8 bits on this processor, the 1802 still does 16-bit addresses, but it multiplexes 8 pins. Uh, we're not concerned about that because we're not actually putting any memory out here. We don't care what the address bus does. Uh, whatever the processor thinks it's doing when it executes random code, it's just going to do that. And then when it expects to be reading something from memory at whatever address it thinks it's sending out, that's going to just be reading in random junk so the next instruction it executes is going to be random and it'll go off and do that and it'll quite happily do that not knowing any better that what it's doing is totally random and nonsensical so how can I do something with that well the goal here was to make some blinking lights so this particular old sketch that I'm working with um, I've actually built something similar to this before that had quite a lot more LEDs but the goal here is to kind of do a minimum parts count arrangement. So here are the upper four uh, address lines and here are the lower four address lines. And there's also an output called SC0. SC0 is a, um, a state code output as is SC1, which we're not messing with here. Uh, SC0 will be zero whenever it thinks it's fetching an instruction. It'll also do it if you're in a DMA function, but we're locking out the DMAs because those inputs are tied high. So when it's fetching, it's going to be a zero, and when it's trying to execute an instruction, the SC0 will be a one. So during the course of the aforementioned random execution of instructions, the SC0 line will be turning on and off. So we can make use of that. Uh, here's an arrangement that uses nine LEDs so each of the address lines goes to two LEDs but it's always one cathode and one anode and the same thing on this side plus we're treating the SC0 as an additional uh, address line and so two of the diodes are connected to that but again it's always a situation where no one of these lines is tied to two cathodes and no line is tied to two anodes. So I've got a little sketch made up where I'm going to wire those LEDs up now. Alright, so there's another thing about the 1802. Um, it's CMOS outputs, um, you know, including the address bus, are inherently current limited. Uh, to just a few milliamps. Um, I don't think it's more than five milliamps and it might be as low as one milliamp. So we technically should not need resistors to limit the current for these LEDs. Just the fact that they are connected to inherently current limited um, pins on the processor should do the trick. So if I've done everything right, these are all wired up and um, I'm going to turn the power on and see what happens. There we go. Blinking lights. So at 6 volts I'm drawing from just a few milliamps up to a bit more depending on which combination of uh, LEDs are currently energized, but I don't think it's ever going higher than 30 milliamps total 
for even when quite a few of the LEDs are turned on at a time. Okay, I'm going to attempt to intone the sacred chant of blinkin' lights. Achtung! Alles lucken peepers! Das computen machine is nicht für gefingerpoken und mitten graben. Ist easy schnappen der springen work, blowen fusen und poppen korken mit spitzen sparken. Ist nicht für gewirken bei das dummkopfen. Das rubber necker in sight zier and keepen hands in das pockets. Relaxant und watch das blinken lights. So, just to recap, we have a microprocessor with no memory, practically no external circuitry, no program of a defined sort, only randomly read in data, and yet it is, from its standpoint, executing a program. It's just a nonsensical program, and one which will never end as long as the power is applied. Now, um, just having your finger near the chip should change the data it reads in, but since it's so random anyway, probably wouldn't notice any difference, but let's just see here. You know, you can't really tell. I'm sure I'm changing the field around there, but you don't know what it was going to do randomly before I put my finger there. So, it's sort of meaningless. This kind of thing is pretty handy for applications such as, you know, if you're making a, a special effect or just a little gizmo or <laughs> you're trying to rig up a Star Trek or spaceship or science fiction fake panel for some production or something and you just want to have lights flickering around. Something like this could do the job very easily and uh, cheaply. Um, if the speed is too fast, if you don't want them to flicker that fast, you can change the capacitance. This is currently a 0 0.01 microfarad, and if I plug in a 0.1 in parallel with it, it slows it way down. So it's easy to change the speed is the point here. Take the cap back out and it speeds up. What happens when I double the number of LEDs? I leave the original nine in their original connection and then I connect nine more which with each LED across its mate in the opposite direction. So between any two address pins, I've got one LED pointing cathode right and another one pointing cathode left. Let's see what happens with that. So obviously it works, so that's a simple way to get an even more complex pattern. 